on World News Tonight. Shoot for the sun. Following the overwhelming success of India's lunar lander, the nation's hopes fall on the sun with a new rocket. Highway wreaks havoc. Taiwan suffers the wrath of the first typhoon to hit the nation in years. Changing stations. Ukraine's Zelensky replaces Defence Minister amid a full-blown corruption scandal. And one night only, Armani brings sparkle and stars to Venice in celebration of the 80th Film Festival in the Canal City. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you are joining us on World News this Monday night. After its recent successful moon landing, India's space agency has launched a rocket to study the sun. After its recent successful moon landing, India's space agency has launched a rocket to study the sun. It's the country's first such mission, which aims to study solar winds that can cause disturbances on Earth, commonly seen as auroras. Scientists clapped during the Indian Space Research Organization's live broadcast as a rocket left a trail of smoke and fire in its wake on Saturday. India's space agency later said on the social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, that the satellite was now in orbit. Named after the Hindi word for the sun, the Aditya L1 spacecraft took flight barely a week after India beat Russia to become the first country to land on the south pole of the moon. While Russia had a more powerful rocket, India's Chandrayaan-3 outendured the Lunar 25 to execute a textbook landing. The Aditya L1 is designed to travel 930,000 miles over four months, far short of the sun, which is around 93 million miles from Earth. It's meant to stop its journey in a kind of parking lot in space called a Lagrange point. Objects tend to stay put there because of balancing gravitational forces, which reduce a spacecraft's fuel consumption. Scientists hope to learn more about the effects of solar radiation on the thousands of satellites in orbit. ISRO scientists also say that longer term, data from the mission could help better understand the sun's impact on Earth's climate patterns and the origins of solar wind, the stream of particles that flow from the sun through the solar system. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is pushing for India's space missions to play a larger role on a world stage dominated by the United States and China. The country has privatised space launches and is looking to open the sector to foreign investment, as it targets a five-fold increase in its share of the global launch market within the next decade. The first typhoon to directly hit Taiwan in four years, Hakui, made landfall on Sunday in the island's mountainous and sparsely populated far southeast before moving across the south of the country. Typhoon Haikwei burrowed into southeastern Taiwan on Sunday, prompting counties and cities in the region to cancel classes and declare a day off for workers. The torrential rain and strong winds led to the cancellation of domestic flights and the evacuation of thousands of people. Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen advised the public to avoid leaving the house. The typhoon is the first to directly hit Taiwan in four years. Reports of major damage have been minimal so far, but the military has stepped in to assist with flood relief and evacuation efforts, mobilizing soldiers and equipment to affected areas. As a precaution, Taiwanese airlines cancel all domestic flights and ferry services to surrounding islands were also suspended. Typhoon Haikwe is expected to continue its path across southern Taiwan before entering the Taiwan Strait and heading towards China. Meanwhile, several roads in the Madrid region in Spain were also closed as half a dozen bridges were torn down by water overflowing the riverbanks. This was the scene across several regions of Spain on Sunday as torrential rain and storms swept through the country. In the capital, Madrid's mayor warned residents to stay home. A red alert extending from Madrid to the city of Cadiz in the south was issued by the National Weather Agency, meaning possible extreme danger. Madrid's emergency services sent these texts to residents, warning them of flood risks and advising them not to use vehicles. On the east coast, residents of Alcanar were also told to stay home by emergency services. 
Video footage shared on social media showed torrents of flood water rushing past homes. This man says he was woken up from water coming through the second floor of his apartment. He says the community pulled two young men from the water with ropes made from towels and bed sheets. Nobody showed up, he says, calling the experience terrifying. Further down the coast in Castellon, firefighters released footage of people being saved after their vehicles were trapped in the floods. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said he would dismiss Defense Minister Oleski Rezginov from his post and would ask Parliament to replace him with Rostam Umerov, head of Ukraine's main privatization fund. During his nightly address to the nation Sunday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky announced plans to dismiss Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov from his post. Zelensky said he planned to ask Parliament this week to replace him with Rostam Umerov who heads Ukraine's main privatization fund. Austria. The move sets the stage for the biggest shakeup of Ukraine's defense establishment since the war was launched by Russia in February 2022. Reznikov, who was named defense minister in November 2021, has helped secure billions of dollars of Western military aid to help the war effort. But he has been dogged by graft allegations surrounding his ministry, which he described as smears. The change of defense minister must be approved by parliament, which Zelensky said he expects to happen. Umarov has headed Ukraine's state property fund since September 2022 and has played a role in sensitive wartime negotiations. Meanwhile, Russia has launched an overnight air attack on one of Ukraine's major grain exporting ports. Ukrainian officials have also said this hours before Russian President Vladimir Putin and his Turkish counterpart Tayyip Erdogan are due to hold talks in a long-shot bid to revive a Ukrainian grain export agreement in time for the autumn harvest. It's a meeting that could define the future of global food security. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is meeting Russian President Vladimir Putin in Sochi on Monday hoping to convince him to rejoin the Black Sea grain deal that he pulled out of in July. Russia's defence minister laid out the Kremlin's conditions in a meeting with Turkey's foreign minister ahead of the summit. Today, the deal is no more, and it's not our fault. There's only one thing to say, that if everything that was promised to Russia is fulfilled, which seems like a very simple thing to do, then the deal would be extended. The agreement was brokered by the UN and Turkey. It meant that ships were allowed by Russia to safely leave several Ukrainian ports in and around Odessa and travel through an agreed corridor in the Black Sea. The ships were then inspected near Istanbul by representatives from Russia, Ukraine, Turkey and the UN before setting off for other parts of the world and helping relieve hunger in some of the hardest hit corners of the globe, including Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Sudan and Yemen. In the space of a year, the agreement allowed for the export of nearly 33 million metric tonnes of grain and other commodities from Ukraine. But as the deal's expiration date drew closer, Russia refused to extend it, saying it had faced obstacles exporting its own food and fertilisers and that the West was not holding up its side of the deal. The UN says it recently sent Russia concrete proposals aimed at reviving the agreement. We took into concern uh, r the Russian uh, uh, requests and I believe we presented a proposal that uh, could be the basis for a renewal, but a renewal that must be stable. The UN's Food and Agriculture Organization has warned the repercussions of the war in Ukraine could push an additional 47 million people into acute food insecurity. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. And now 
Now moving on to tonight's U.S. election updates. GOP nominee hopeful Nikki Haley on Sunday again advocated for term limits and mental competency tests for politicians over the age of 75, saying that they need to let a younger generation take over. The former UN ambassador stated that her intention was not to be disrespectful, pointing to Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Senator Dianne Feinstein and Nancy Pelosi as examples, posing the question of when they will realize that it is time for them to leave. McConnell, 81, has had his health and future questioned following a second incident where he froze for nearly 30 seconds during a press conference in Kentucky last week. Feinstein, 90, faced multiple health setbacks this year after an extended battle with shingles and a fall last month. Pelosi, 83, stepped down from her leadership role following Democrats' loss of the House, prompting questions about whether she intends to keep a seat she has held since 1987. According to research from the PEW Research Center, the median age for voting House members is 57.9, a slight decrease from the 117th Congress. On the Senate side, the median age is 65.3 years. Haley is 51 years old. In February, she first made a call for testing of politicians over the age of 75, a group that also includes President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump, both of whom are running for the presidency again in 2024. That call was widely criticized even among GOP presidential contenders such as Vivek Ramaswamy, who are quite a bit younger. Meanwhile, Vivek Ramaswamy argued that pardoning former President Donald Trump would reunite the country but will not be the most important thing he'll do as the next president. Noting that he is polling second among GOP presidential candidates in some recent national polls, Ramaswamy argued that though it would be easier for him if Donald Trump were eliminated from the competition, he is against the current Republican frontrunner being forced out of the race amidst a four indictment against him. Ramaswamy repeatedly argued that there is a difference between a bad judgment and a crime. He also noted how just like all other Republicans on the Milwaukee debate stage, they took a pledge to support whoever becomes the party's eventual 2024 presidential nominee to qualify. Five civilians were killed by bombs that fell on their homes in Khartoum, a Sudanese medical source has told, a day after an airstrike in the city's south killed at least 20 civilians. Smoke billowed over Khartoum's skyline on Sunday as the sound of artillery fire rings out. Aerial bombardment that marks a weekend of bloodshed in the fifth month of war between Sudan's army and paramilitary fighters. Further north in Omdurman, residents are struggling to make ends meet. Many haven't received salaries for several months, leaving them unable to feed their families. <laughs> The reason why there is a lot of bread on the shelves is because people aren't able to buy it. People here don't buy in large quantities. People are suffering. The days of customers coming in with plenty of cash are over. Bread is available, but people can't buy it. A loaf costs 70 Sudanese pounds. It's too expensive. The country was plunged into war mid-April after a deepening power struggle exploded into conflict between the Sudanese army chief, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, and Hermeti, the paramilitary rapid support forces commander. The pair joined forces to stage the country's 2021 coup, though clashed over disagreements about a plan to transition to civilian rule. According to the UN, over half of Sudan's 48 million population now require humanitarian aid, and six million are one step away from famine. North Korea has staged a simulated tactical nuclear attack drill over the weekend with mock atomic warheads attached to two long-range cruise missiles that were test-fired into the ocean. North Korea has conducted a simulated tactical nuclear attack drill that included two long-range cruise missiles, the KCNA state news agency said on Sunday. It added that the exercise was to warn enemies the country would be prepared in case of nuclear war. KCNA said the drill was successfully carried out on Saturday when two cruise missiles carrying mock nuclear warheads were fired towards the West Sea of the Korean Peninsula. Pyongyang also said it would bolster its military deterrence against the United States and South Korea. South Korea's military said the claim of success could be an exaggeration as, quote, not all of them succeeded, Seoul's Yonhap News reported, citing a senior official at the Joint Chiefs of Staff.
The latest missile test came just after the joint annual exercises between South Korea and the US came to a close on Thursday. North Korea has been stepping up its military deterrence against Washington and Seoul and has criticised last month's summit agreement between the two on improving military cooperations. Pope Francis praised the wisdom of the Mongolian people over the weekend in harmony with nature and embracing spirituality, while warning the young democracy of risks such as corruption and environmental ruin. Far from the immense crowds he often attracts around the world, Pope Francis has had more modest welcomes from the public ever since landing for the first time in Mongolia. Smaller scale greetings, but no less enthusiastic. We're all here to greet the Holy Father. We're about to see him, and we've been waiting for this moment for many years. I hope that the Pope visits us in China too, so he can help strengthen the communication with the Vatican, and also all the other countries where Catholics live. The predominantly Buddhist country counts only around one and a half thousand Catholics, and the church has only had a sanctioned presence in Mongolia since 1992 when the country moved on from its Soviet allied government and added religious freedom to its constitution. After visiting traditional Gur tents and meeting with the president, Pope Francis addressed a message to those contributing to people's misfortunes. When religions remain grounded in their original spiritual patrimony and are not corrupted by sectarian deviations, they prove to be trustworthy supports in the construction of healthy and prosperous societies. Corruption is the fruit of a utilitarian and unscrupulous mentality that has impoverished entire countries. An apparent reference to the theft of hundreds of thousands of tonnes of coal last year as people braved freezing temperatures in the capital Ulaanbaatar to protest the scandal. Pope Francis will lead an inter-religious meeting on Sunday and conduct a mass in a newly built ice hockey arena before leaving Mongolia on Monday. Welcome back for more news. Let's take you around the world in a minute. According to Mali sports minister, former Mali Marseille and Senin attacker Salif Keita died aged 76 on Saturday. When the Portland Fire Department in Oregon was called to rescue someone who was stuck in chest deep, but they didn't realize they were rescuing a man who had escaped from the Oregon State Hospital. After the rescue, a quick thinking hospital employee made the connection to the escape and police arrested him. The wildfire in the northeastern region of Everest has killed at least 20 people, destroyed homes and livelihoods, and squashed last forests. While summer wildfires are common in Greece, the government says conditions with scientists linked to climate change have made them more intense this year. Authorities in Gaza have appealed to help put out a fire that has been burning for days in a waste landfill site, sending foul smelling smoke spiraling across the block with the Uncle which already suffers from severe environmental problems. With more than 100,000 new migrant survivors in New York City since last spring, the focus is now turning to the influx of new students who will be starting school this week. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight in Venice as Italian fashion designer Giorgio Armani brought sparkle and stars to the Canal City with a one night only fashion show coinciding with the 80th Venice Film Festival. Thank you for watching. Have a great night. <laughs>